Hi guys, so this is our day one for your ELA work. Today we're going to go over on page 27 in your activity book. Remember these books. Once you get that, some of you may not have received it in your um, in the mail, but it's going to be this one. It says activity book. And you're going to go to page 27. Okay. And does our vocab. Okay, I'll go over each of them. You guys can look at them over your book. And then we're going to read the chapter. I'll ask questions throughout. And that'll be what today's assignment will be. All right, so all I'm going to do is we'll go over our vocab. Then I will read chapter 3, page 22 in your reader, Tales from the Great Plains. I'll read that. And then that'll be it for your ELA for um, today. All right, so find your activity book. Get it to page 27, okay? And it should have vocabulary for Tales from the Great Plains, right? So remember, you guys can pause this at any time to get the book, the material, anything you need. So just pause the video, figure it out, and then you can replay it as well. So number one, the first vocab word is remnant. Now that had the little N next to remnant in it. Does anyone remember what N stands for? A noun, right? And nouns are what? A per person, place, thing, or animal. Okay? And the definition of remnant is a leftover piece, a small part of the whole. Sometimes they'd leave like remnants of food around or remnants of supplies around. Okay? Number two. Scout. It has two definitions. That's why the number one is there and there's a number two in the definition. Let's see, I'll show you. So you have the number one and then the number two. The one is a noun again, an N. Okay, person, place, or thing. And that's someone who is sent somewhere in advance of others to gather information. Okay, so it's someone to go and like scout out situations. And then two is to observe. It's got the V next to it. So this one's a verb. And this one's to observe someone or something in order to gather and report information about that person or thing. Okay? So a scout, if it's a noun, will be someone that's going to gather information. You go and scout for information. If it's a verb, okay, that's when you're going to go and observe someone or do something and report information about that person or thing. Number three, band. Some of you um, know what a band is. It is a noun as well. It's got the N next to it, and it's a group of people. Animals are things that act together to achieve a common purpose. Okay? Sometimes animals may act together to team up on something. Maybe you'll have people that go together that will be a musical band. Okay? Number four, council. That is a well as a noun. And that's a group of people chosen to lead or give advice. So that's kind of like your leader, but it's a group of people. They're going to give advice or lead. And then number five is a walk-in. It's a noun. And it says, in the Sioux culture, a supernatural power. So it's a type of natural power that the Sioux believe in. Okay? And remember, next to each of our definitions, they have the page. So this one's going to show up on page 22 in your reader. This one will be, what, 23, okay? 26, 26, and 26. Okay? So now that we went over our vocab words, I'm going to have you get your reader books. This will be chapter 3. It's page 22. Well, if it makes it easier if I highlight it, it'll be page 22. Okay. I'll go through. I'll ask you guys questions throughout. Again, you can pause it, tell your parents the answers. You can just say them out loud while I'm asking you. You can... Listen for the answer once I'm done, okay? And then when we're done reading this, the questions, then we will be all done for day one with ELA. Again, I made it so you guys can comment on these ones. So if you have any questions, you can comment or get a hold of me any way, shape, or form that I've given your parents um, permission to do. Chapter 3, Tales from the Great Plains. The image of a brave warrior on a horseback gazing over his beloved prairie or canyon is perhaps one of the things that comes to mind when we think of the Native Americans. Horses were and remain essential to many Native American cultures, but
but there was a long time ago, there was a time long ago, when Native Americans did not know about horses. When Native Americans first saw the Spanish conquistadors on their horses, they wondered if man and horse were one beast, for they had never seen a human riding any kind of animal. So when they first saw these guys, they were thinking that it was a man, horse. They did not think that they were two different people because they had never seen a human riding any type of animal. The Comanche soon realized this was not true, but many years would pass before they learned to talk to the horses and ride them like the Spaniards. So, who were better riders of the horses at first? The Spaniards. There was once a great horse that all the Comanche feared. This horse ran wild on the prairies, and none of the Comanche would ever go near him, for he was fierce and powerful. They let him roam and never tried to catch him. The horse was easy to identify because he always wore a saddle and the remnants, remember that was one of our vocab words, so it's small pieces, of a blue silk blanket on his back. This is a story of how the horse with the blue blanket came to roam free on the prairie. So now we're going to page 23, the Indian on it. So they're going to have two different stories. This first one's called the Swift Blue One by the Comanche. One day, a brave young Comanche warrior was out hunting when he saw a Spanish soldier riding on a horse. The soldier wore heavy metal armor and he carried a gun and a long sharp sword. Perhaps the soldier was lost or perhaps he was a scout sent to discover what was over the next hill. The young Comanche warrior and his people considered the Spanish to be enemies. For the Spanish, with their guns, sharp steel swords, and powerful horses, sometimes attacked the Comanche camps. Fear and anger rushed through the Comanche's veins, and he rose from his hiding place in the tall grass and shot an arrow at the Spaniard. The arrow found its way through a crack in the soldier's armor, and he fell from his horse to the ground with a loud thud. Wounded, he moaned in pain. His horse stood over him, and he did not move. So what did the Comanche do? He shot a arrow, and it hit a Spaniard. So now we're on page 24, this picture. The Comanche wanted to approach the Spaniard to inspect his strange weapons and armor. But when he drew near, the horse snorted angrily and beat his front hooves on the ground. So the horse kind of got up and started getting a little upset. The Comanche was afraid of the horse, and he backed away. He wanted the horse to leave, so he snarled and growled and yelled at him. But the horse still did not budge. The Comanche did not speak the horse language, and he did not know what to do next. The Spaniard could see that the Comanche wanted to talk to the horse. Using sign language, the Spaniard told the Comanche that he would teach him the horse language if the Comanche would spare his life. So, what was the deal? The Spaniard would do what? Teach him horse language. But the Comanche warrior had to spare his life. The Comanche agreed. The Spaniard taught the Comanche the words people use to make the horse go and stop. Walk and gallop. The Comanche repeated the words again and again until he knew them and could say them to the horse. The Comanche tried to save the Spaniard's life, but the arrow was too deep, and he died anyway. The horse had a soft blue blanket and a saddle on its back. The Comanche did not remove either, because he thought the horse wanted them. Then the Comanche got into the horse's back and spoke the horse language, and the horse carried him back to camp. So that's pretty cool that he learned how to speak the language from the Spaniard, but no matter what he did, the Spaniard still couldn't stay alive, right? The other Comanche were amazed when they saw him. He told them this story and showed them how he learned to make the horse go and stop, walk and gallop. So the four things he learned how to do was to tell him to go and stop and then walk and gallop. So going and stopping pretty important and then walking and gallop would mean he's going to teach him how to go slow or speed up after that the Comanche warrior always rode the horse and he became a fearsome warrior and a great hunter he named the horse the swift blue one because he was as fast as the wind does anyone remember why it'd be the blue one 
what does the horse have on his back? Yeah, he's got those remnants of the blue blanket. The other warriors were afraid of the horse, and they thought he would ride over them and crush them with his big hooves. One day the warrior was killed in battle, but the swift blue one survived. The other Comanche were still afraid of the horse, so they set him free to roam on the prairie. They would see him out there sometimes running as fast as the wind with a saddle and blue blanket on his back. So the Comanche warrior ended up doing what? He got killed. And who survived? The blue swift. Swift blue. In time, more horses escaped from the Spanish soldiers, and these horses joined the swift blue one out in the prairie. He became their chief, and they followed him everywhere. The swift blue one's herd grew and grew until there were too many horses to count. Eventually, other Comanche learned the horse language and the horse culture spread. Many of the horses ridden by the Sioux, Apache, Pawnee, and the other tribes of the Great Plains and beyond are the descendants of the swift blue one. See all the pictures of the horses on here. So this one obviously is who? The Sioux swift blue one. And then there's his whole group of uh, horses that are following him. Now that was one story in the book. We gotta read the second story. Tomorrow when we read this, we're gonna compare these two stories. So we're gonna read about the swift blue one tomorrow, and we're gonna read the white buffalo calf woman, and we're gonna compare them, okay? On the Great Plains among the Lakota and other Sioux nations, it was customary for young people to embark on a vision quest. Remember that, a vision quest. A vision quest helped to guide a young person's actions and decisions as an adult. The vision quest was just one of the seven sacred ceremonies practiced by the Lakota. So how many different ceremonies were there? Seven. And the vision quest was just one of them. According to Lakota legend, the people learned these seven ceremonies from the white buffalo calf woman. So the one that was in charge was the white buffalo calf woman. Many years ago, when the Sioux people were young and had not learned their way in the world, the bands of the Lakota tribe met for a council. This was during a terribly hot summer, when the land was parched and the buffalo had moved so far away that the people could not find them. This was before the Sioux had horses, so they had to travel on foot, and sometimes they could not keep up with the buffalo. Two brave young men went out to scout for buffalo. They searched everywhere but they could find no signs of buffalo or anything else to eat. Remember, during the plains, they were nomadics. They had to go and figure out how to get their food. They have to travel with their food and find the buffalo. One day they saw a hill and decided to climb up to see what they could see. In the distance, they spied something strange coming toward them. At first, they could only make out a small speck, and then they could not tell whether it was moving on the ground or in the air. As it neared, they saw that it was a human figure. As it came nearer still, they could see that it was a beautiful young woman. She wore clothing of bright white buckskin decorated with beautiful, colorful designs. Two dark braids of hair tangled down, and she had red dots painted on each cheek. The two men could see that she was no ordinary woman. They realized that she was a wakit a sacred and powerful thing. So remember, that was one of our d definitions. And that was when in the Sioux culture, a supernatural, let me try to get this in, a supernatural power. So she was one of them. She had more power than you would expect. One of the men trembled with fear. So they were really, really scared as the walking stranger approached. The other, however, was smitten with love. She is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, he told his friend. I want to marry her. So we've got one that's really, really scared, and the other one that is falling in love with her. Do not go near her, said the other. You must respect her and do as she says. But the love-struck man did not listen to these wise words. Instead, he approached the walking stranger. Suddenly, a cloud of smoke enveloped both. Now we're on page 20. Here's a picture of her. Here's the two people two um, Indians. So now we are on page 28. The picture should look like this. Okay. Of them. The other man could not see through the smoke, but when it finally cleared, 
the woman was alone, and all that remained of his friend was a pile of scorched bones. So what did she end up doing to him? She killed him. Truly afraid, the young man raised his bow and pointed an arrow at her. But she said, Do not harm me. I am white buffalo calf woman, and I bring good things for you and your people. The young man dropped his bow and listened, comforted by her kind words. Go home and tell your chief to raise the medicine teepee and prepare for my arrival. In four days, I will bring my gifts to your people. So the young man hurried home and shared the news. Some people did not believe him. They thought that he must have been crazy with hunger, which means that he was so hungry that he saw things. But the chief heard the words and commanded his people to raise the great medicine teepee, the largest teepee which they used for the holiest ceremonies. Sure enough, four days later, the people saw the white buffalo calf woman approaching the camp. In her arms, she carried a large bundle. How many days did she say to get ready? Four. Page 29. The chief invited her into the medicine teepee. Inside, she told the people to make an altar of red earth in the middle of the teepee and to place a buffalo skull upon it. She also told them to make a small rack using three sticks. Then she opened her bundle and removed a special object, the sacred pipe, called Chanupa, which she placed on the rack. So she took out a pipe, she placed it on the rack. Into the pipe, she put bark of the red willow tree, and she placed a buffalo chip on the fire. The buffalo chip made the everlasting fire, the fire to be passed from generation to generation. Then she lit the pipe. The smoke of this pipe is the breath of the great spirit Tunkashila, she said. She taught the people to pray using the sacred pipe. With your feet on the ground and the smoke of the pipe rising to the sky, this pipe forms a connection between you and the great spirit. She taught them the pipe filling song and how to raise the pipe toward Grandfather Sky, and then toward Grandmother Earth. And then, in all four directions, she continued, the wooden stem of the pipe represents all the things that grow on the earth. The bowl at the end of the stem is the buffalo, which is the flesh and the blood of your people. Twelve feathers, so twelve of them, were hanging from the stem, represent the spotted eagle, the messenger of the great spirit. And engraved in the bowl, there are seven circles. These are the seven sacred ceremonies you will practice with the pipe. So we have seven ceremonies. These are the seven ceremonies she taught the people. The sacred pipe ceremony, the sweat lodge, the vision quest, the sun dance, the making of relatives, the keeping of the soul, and the preparing of a girl for womanhood. These are the seven ceremonies practiced by the Lakota Sioux, which they learned from the white buffalo calf woman. So she taught them all seven things. All right, so ELA's done for today, guys. Great job listening to it. Again, you can pause it. You can leave comments. Your parents can get a hold of me by Class Dojo or calling me, and I will answer any questions as I can, email as well. Okay, so I hope you guys have a great day, and... I will begin math shortly.